Again, it says there, the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved, moved and went behind them. That is what we see is said there in my key verse for today. As I shared with you last week, we as genuine believers, we ought to rest assured in the fact that God is always moving on our behalf. I want you to know, and I want you to understand today that God's got your back. He is always moving on your behalf. God, I want you to know and understand today he is your shield. God is your protection in this world that we live in today. Now, when you hear me say that God's got your back, I want you to think for a second about what that means to you. What does it mean to you when you hear me say that God's got your back? I suppose that our thoughts would instantly go to how we define what it means for someone to have our back. When one has another's back, we would say that that means that they will be there to look out for us. They will watch out for us and they will help us with whatever sort of help that we may need whenever that help is needed. So the ones that have your back, they are the ones that you believe will be there for you through thick and through thin. We will say that those who have our backs, we will say that they are our biggest allies. To some of you, knowing that God's got your back, it brings about a certain assurance, doesn't it? You see, I am certainly one that feels greatly reassured that God's got my back as I continue on my journey through life. You see, the Lord, he has brought me through so much. God has brought me through so many trials. God has brought me through so many tribulations. He has lifted me over obstacles and he has lifted me over opposition. So and I tell you today that I am very well assured and am reassured that God's got my back. I would suggest to you today that the believer, we ought to rest assured that God again has our back, that God is our shield and that God is our protection. I tell you today that we true believers, we ought to rest assured that God is our shield and that God is our protection because the Lord is always watching over us. The Lord is our shepherd. In the 23rd Psalm, David, he spoke about the Lord being his shepherd. David said of God as his shepherd, that the Lord leads him to lie down in green pastures and besides not rushing waters, but still waters. David said that with the Lord as a shepherd, that he is comforted by the Lord's rod and by God's staff through the valley of the shadow of death. With God as his shepherd, David said that he feared no evil because God again was always watching over him. He was always in God's keep. He was always in God's care. You see, I feel like we often gloss over the 23rd Psalm. That passage of scripture, we, we gloss over it because, you know, that was that passage of scripture that we had to remember as children. And because we had to remember it as children, the words simply became words. You know what I mean by that? They lost meaning. There was no thought to those words. It was just something that we had to memor memorize. In that psalm, David, I want you to understand, he spoke with great understanding. 
from his own personal walk of life, from his own personal walk with the Lord David. He spoke that 23rd Psalm from his own personal experience. And I, and I tell you today that we must learn to have this same kind of understanding of the Lord being our shepherd. As our shepherd in the 10th chapter of John's gospel in this familiar passage of scripture, Jesus said that he is the doorkeeper to his sheepfold. He is the doorkeeper to his flock. This means that nothing can come into the fold of Christ unless he, Christ, allows it to come into his flock. So I would tell you that with Jesus being the doorkeeper or the door, I will tell you that there is safety. I will tell you that there is security behind the door that is Jesus Christ. As the good shepherd, Jesus, he goes before his flock and we, his flock, we follow him. When you and I follow Christ, no matter what we face along the way as we follow him, our good shepherd, I want you to know that he protects you. Our good shepherd, he protects all of us who follow him. And Jesus, he said that in the 11th verse of the 10th chapter of John's gospel, he said that he gives his life for his flock. So what I, ask, I, would, I, I would ask you all today, how could you not feel reassured after hearing these words coming from Jesus Christ himself, who says that he is the door to you? He said that he is your shield and that he is your protection. How could you not feel assured being behind the doors of Christ. As we know, Christ did lay down his life for his flock when he was crucified on the cross so that you and I could have a chance so that you and I could have an opportunity at everlasting life. When he rose from the grave, Jesus proclaimed that all authority had been given to him. So I would ask you today, why would I choose for Christ to not have my back. Why would I choose against Christ? It would seem that if there was anyone that you would want to have your back, it would seem that you would want it to be Christ. So why would you choose against it? There are several others who, on the other hand, do not believe that some imaginary God could ever have their back. I feel sorry for those that think that way. They choose to rely on others to have their backs than the Lord, the one who has all authority, all power. Now, I would tell you all today that it is certainly a good thing when we are surrounded by people that will have our backs. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being surrounded by good people that will have your back. Scripture, after all, testifies that it is good to have one that can sharpen another. Scripture testifies to the fact that it is good to have help around you, those who can help uplift you when you are in need of being uplifted. Scripture testifies to this. So it, again, it is certainly not a bad thing when you are surrounded by people that have your back. That is certainly a blessing. However, we must be honest with the fact that we cannot have each other's back in the manner that we always wish. What I mean by this is that we cannot have each other's back every minute in every second of the day. At the end of the day, we are simply human beings, aren't we? You and I, we can get fatigued. You and I, we can grow weary. You and I, we can grow tired, can't we? 
Not only can we grow weary, not only can we grow tired, but there are days when we become ill, when we become sick with disease. Some of us, like me, may have a day where we have a disability. These things, they do not account for the fact that we also have times where all of us have to deal with our own personal issues that may keep us from being able to help those whose back we say that we have. All of these things in itself can make things rather difficult for us to have each other's back around the clock as we so desire. So, yes, it is a good thing to have people that can have your back. But I tell you, we need to have someone to have our back that can have our back around the clock. 24-7, 365 or 366. We need someone who can have our back that can be even more reliable than the people who say that they have our backs today. Yes, it is truly a blessing that you can be surrounded by good people who have your back, but I tell you today that it is an even better blessing for God, the one who has all authority. It is even a better blessing when God has your back. I hope that you choose for the Lord to have your back today. Now, last week I referenced how when Satan wanted to put Job to the test, how he remarked how the Lord had a hedge about Job, around Job. So Satan, he remarked or complained, if you will, how there was a shield that prevented him from testing Job as he desired. A shield that was coming from the Lord. I want to show you again this week how the Lord moves. How the Lord moves to have the backs of those who rely on his protection. I, I want to show you this today because I want you to rely on the protection of God. I want you to choose for God to have your back today in this world that we live in. Here in the 14th chapter of Exodus, we find the children of Israel now beginning their journey. They have left Egypt and we are told in the opening verse of this 14th chapter of book of Exodus that they had turned and that they had made camp between Migdal and the sea. So by the 14th chapter, after having left Egypt, no longer in the bondage of Egypt, the children of Israel, they were enjoying the blessing of their brand new liberty, their brand new freedom. However, we will see here in this chapter, back in Egypt, Pharaoh was stirring. Pharaoh, he was not happy with letting the children of Israel go. We are told there in the fourth verse that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart yet again. Pharaoh's heart was hardened to the point that Pharaoh decided there again in the fourth verse to pursue the children of Israel. Now, this was not the first time that Pharaoh's heart was hardened by the Lord against the children of Israel. Now, someone might ask, why did God harden the heart of Pharaoh? Why did God continue to harden the heart of Pharaoh? What was the purpose? What was the reason for this? Now, for us to answer this question, we must first examine the kind of person that the Pharaoh was in his heart. As we know, the Pharaohs, they were the heads, they were the kings 
the most powerful and the most advanced, na advanced nation in the world around that period of time. Most pharaohs, they tended to think very highly of themselves, which again was very typical of kings, of emperors, and even of dictators. So this pharaoh was no different, right? Th this pharaoh, he thought so highly of himself that he thought himself to be a god among men, and, and he desired for the children of Israel to serve him and his people like he was a god. So this Pharaoh, I want you to understand, was a very prideful person. Now, there were a few reasons as to why God hardened the heart of this man. As I mentioned in last week's Sunday school lesson, the primary reason that the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh was so that God could reveal to mankind his power so that God could reveal, reveal to mankind his authority over all things. However, at the same time, the Lord desired to send a message to the prideful, to all of those who were filled and driven by their pride. Again, Pharaoh, he thought of himself to be a God because he lorded over a people that he had enslaved. So the second reason that Pharaoh's heart was hardened was because God sought to humble the proud. In our scripture for today, we see that the Lord said that he hardened the heart of Pharaoh so that Pharaoh would pursue the children of Israel. In doing this, God said there in the fourth verse, that he would gain the honor over Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. The man who was, who was filled with pride, the man who thought himself to be a God, the Lord said there that he would gain the honor over Pharaoh and over all of his army. The Egyptians would know that he is the Lord. God wanted the world to know back then that he was the Lord. And I tell you today that the Lord still wants the world to know that he is the Lord, that he is God, that he is God over all things. Do you know and believe that the Lord is Lord over all things? If so, why have you not chosen for the Lord to have your back? Do you believe that God's got your back today? Wouldn't you want the Lord to have your back? As we continue through this passage of scripture here in the 14th chapter, <clears throat> Pharaoh and his servants, they began to question what they had just done in freeing the children of Israel. We see that they said to themselves there in the fifth verse, they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from, again, underline, underline this, go from serving us. They thought of themselves as gods, especially Pharaoh. After saying this, we will see there in the sixth verse that Pharaoh began to make ready his chariot for pursuing the children of Israel. Scripture tells us that he took his people with him and added 600 choice chariots to those that he was taking to pursue the children of Israel. We're told there in the seventh verse, there was appointed to all the chariots of Egypt captains to every one of them. So let us set the scene here. Let us, let us set the scene here of, of what we are witnessing today. As we saw in my sermon last week, the children of Israel, they were camping in peace with no regards as to what was happening elsewhere. Elsewhere, we see that Pharaoh had a sizable army and his sizable army was well equipped and they were mounting up to ride out 
against a people who were not well equipped for any sort of battle. They were not equipped for any sort of conflict. They had just been freed from the bondage of Egypt. Pharaoh, we see there in the third verse, believed the children of Israel to be sitting ducks. Pharaoh believed the children of Israel, they sat bewildered, that they were lost and that they were confused by the land and that they were closed off from going anywhere. In his mind, the children of Israel, they were easy prey. They would be able to be easily defeated and to be brought back into his bondage. Pharaoh considered them to be of no challenge. They were nothing to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh and his army, they pursued the children of Israel with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh to the point that his horsemen and his army, we're told in the eighth and the ninth verse there, they overtook the children of Israel as the children of Israel camped by the sea. I can imagine as scripture shows us here that the children of Israel, that they were terrified in this moment of time. Their brief moment of happiness turned into hopelessness. Have you ever been there before? Where you were happy one moment and your happiness turned into hopelessness. I believe that this is something that we are all likely very familiar with. Those moments when we feel that we have escaped trouble, but suddenly trouble comes knocking at the door again for us and saying, hello, how you doing? Ready to bring all kind of trouble our way. Life, it is often like this. We seemingly move from one thing to the next thing with very few moments of happiness in between. At times, I feel like we are in the midst of a never-ending storm with very few breaks in the storm. I want to liken Pharaoh's pursuit of Israel into something that we as genuine believers we face today. And I don't know if y'all caught it. I don't know if y'all got it. I don't know if you all seen it, but I'm going to share this with you all today what I would liken Pharaoh's pursuit to. And I will liken it to this so that we can again be ready so that we can know and have someone choose someone who will be reliable and have our backs around the clock. As genuine followers of Christ, we have followed Christ away from the bondage of sin. We have, in other words, been set free from the bondage of sin. Yet the master and the ruler of that bondage is not happy. The master and the ruler of that bondage is not happy with the fact that you escape from the shackles of sin. Did you hear that? Do you understand that today? So what does this ruler do in his unhappiness? Does this ruler, does he still not pursue us today? Satan, the father of sins, Satan, the one that desires for you to still be in the bondage of sin. I want you to hear and I want you to know today that he is still giving chase after you this very second. In this very moment, the devil and his army is still pursuing after you because you have been set free from the bondage of sin by Christ himself. The devil ain't happy. The devil is angry. Let's remember the devil is a prideful man and he ain't happy. He still gives chase chase after you today. Have you never felt like Satan is hounding you? 
Have you never felt like Satan is trying to draw you back into the bondage of sin? Have you ever felt like Satan is not after you? If you've ever felt that way, I don't know what's going on with you. Because I feel like Satan is always trying to get me. I feel like Satan is always nagging at me. Trying to get at me. Yes, Satan certainly operates in the, the visible arena, but what's done in the dark eventually comes to light. And I tell you that there are times when we can see Satan is coming. Like the Pharaoh, Satan pursues us with a very great army. And so I feel I must ask today, how do you stand against Satan and his army? Are you well equipped to take on this enemy or are you helpless? Israel, by their outward appearance, would have looked as helpless as they probably felt. They would have appeared to have been defenseless and an easy target for Pharaoh and his army. Yet, I say to you today, though they may have lost hope and appeared to have been defenseless, they were not defenseless by any means. You see, I want you to again know and I want you to see today that God was watching over his flock. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the Lord our God is a mighty good shepherd. Oh, yeah. Israel had a good shepherd watching over them that day. Notice there again in our key verse. Notice there the mention of the angel of God. Mm -hmm. And if you followed our Sunday school lesson last week, you will recognize right away that this angel was not a coming angel. No, this angel was the pre-incarnate Christ. This angel was God, the son present there. And we'll see that he was busy and that he was at work. God was at work. And someone may ask, well, what was the angel of God doing? What was the Lord doing? Well, we'll see there in my key verse. We are told that the angel of God had gone from being before the camp to moving behind the camp. We'll see there in my key verse that the angel of God was the pillar of cloud that led the camp by day. Did you know that, that, that cloud, that pillar of cloud was the angel of God. If you did not know, now, you know, this bit of information is backed up for us in the chapter prior. And there in the 13th chapter of Exodus and the 21st verse, where we are told that the Lord went before the children of Israel by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could go by night as well. That was God. The angel of God is God, the pre-incarnate Christ. And they say Christ don't appear in the Old Testament. Think again. Let us understand clearly here that God was with the children of Israel and like a shepherd, he was watching over them. And I tell you today that God still works in the same way. God is always watching over us. Just as he was always watching over and keeping them. Now, what I want you to pay especially close attention to is what the angel of God did when Pharaoh and his army was approaching, when they had overtook the children of Israel. Notice again in my key verse there that the angel of the Lord again moved. I will underline that in your Bibles. The angel of the Lord moved from going before the camp to going behind the camp. The angel of the Lord switched positions. 
tactically. I said to you today that God's got your back. And we literally see God switching positions here to have the backs of his flock. There in scripture, the children of Israel. Now, why do you suppose that the Lord was switching positions here? I suppose that the answer to that question is a rather easy one. Scripture tells us there in the 20th verse that the angel of God positioned himself between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. The Lord, I want you to see, was being a shield. God was being a protective barrier there for the children of Israel. Now, I want you to try to picture this in your head for a moment. See the pillar of cloud literally switching from being in front of the camp to being behind the camp. That is what both the camps of Israel and the camp of Pharaoh, that is what they saw that day. The cloud switching positions. They saw God moving to have the backs of the children of Israel. We are told in that same verse that to one side, the cloud gave light during the night. That is during the darkness. The light would have been seen, therefore, by the children of Israel, those who are of the flock of God. But on the other side, the cloud only gave off darkness. There was no light. The Egyptians, they were left in the dark. May I say to you today that those who ally with the Lord dwell in his light, while those who choose not to ally with the Lord, they dwell in darkness. How in the world can they attack you when they can't see you, when they are in the dark? That is what it means for God to have your back. When God is at your rear, the enemy can't attack you as the enemy desires. There's a hedge about you. There is a barrier that is about you, a shield that is about you from God. Does God have your back today? If not, I tell you, you better choose for God to have your back. You see, on the battlefield, it is always good to have one that can watch your flank. It is always good to have one that can watch your six, that is, your rear. You never want to get outflanked on the battlefield. And you certainly do not want your enemy to come up from behind you and get the drop on you. The same way that the children of Israel could literally see God switching and moving positions to protect them on their journey to the promised land, I tell you that there are times when you and I can see God doing the same thing for us. Yes, there are days when we can see Satan try to move against us, but at the same time, we can see when God is raising up the barriers. We can see when the enemy is struggling to get at us, when they are falling over in the dark, because God is putting the pieces in, play, in place to protect us on our journey. I've seen God move for me on this battlefield. I've seen opposition trip and fall down while the Lord raises me up over all opposition. I've seen obstacles fall down before me, not by my hand, but by the hands of God. Have you seen that before? I know I have, and I testify of that to you today, that when God's got your back, obstacles will fall down. There'll be nothing that can stand before you. There'll be nothing that can outflank you and your enemy won't be able to get behind you. They won't see the way to do it. I tell you today, not only can we see God moving to protect us on our journey, but as we saw last week, we also know that the Lord, he works in that invisible arena as well. So in other words, the enemy has a rather difficult time when God has our back. 
it is very challenging for the enemy to do anything against one who is of the flock of God. You see, I'm all about the Lord having my back and letting you know that God's got your back as well and encouraging others to choose for God to have their backs. God desires to have all of our backs, but we have to choose the Lord. As the Lord moved to shield and to protect the children of Israel, I want you to know that he does the same for all of us today because we are of his flock. We genuinely believe we have chosen his only begotten son. All who believe in Christ are of the flock of Christ. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord has said to us, you shall not go out with haste nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. That is what the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah. No, the children of Israel, they did not have chariots to do battle with Pharaoh and his army, nor did they have any physical weapons. They honestly, I tell you, they didn't need those things. The reason why they did not need those things is because they had God watching over them, keeping them, shielding and protecting them. While you are on your journey at a distance, I imagine Satan views you as easy prey thinks that you are an easy target, that you are bewildered while you are on your journey. Yet I tell you today that you have God. However, when that roaring lion of Satan finally tries to run up on you, he sees that you have God as well. You know what that roaring lion does? He turns around and he runs away with his tails between his legs because he knows that you are well protected. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul encouraged us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In order to endure those afflictions and the hardships of life and the enemy, Paul encouraged us to put on the whole armor of God. He encouraged us to put on our spiritual girdle, our breastplate, our shards and our helmet. And he told us to, to carry with us a shield and a sword, the sword of the word of God. However, you will notice that in the whole armor of God, that there is no back piece. I remember that this was something that my dad had pointed out to me several years ago. Pop, he asked me, why do you suppose that there is no back piece to the armor of God? He then answered for me, it's because God's got your back. You don't need a back piece when the Lord is watching your rear. I tell you today that, again, God's got your rear. God's got your back. Yes, we are being chased and pursued by Satan and his army. Yet God is watching over us this very second, this very moment. As Satan continues to try and pursue and attack us, no matter what side is no matter what side trouble is coming from, when Satan gets as close as he can to you, he runs into the hedge of God. He runs into the Lord's protective shield of us. Satan, I want you to know, has no power to break through that shield. Satan, the devil, has no power to get through that shield. Because as Jesus said, the good shepherd is that shield. The good shepherd is that door to his fold and Satan can't get past Jesus. Satan cannot defeat Jesus. So therefore, Satan cannot open up the door to the fold of Christ. So again, I say to you that for this very reason, you and I, we have no reason to ever worry about the enemy getting at us. Try as the enemy might, the Lord will continue to give light to us. God will continue to bless us while at the same time shielding and protecting us from all hurt, harm, and danger. Those of you who choose to solely rely on others to have your back, I would ask you today, how are they helping you against Satan and his own? 
I would then encourage you today, ally with the Lord. Make God your ally. Choose to be in fellowship with the Lord. Choose to let God have your back. And I tell you that you too will be blessed as we. Well. Amen. Amen. Amen.